Welcome everybody. This is a run through of the combined science chemistry foundation tier paper that you took for a mock before Christmas. What you need to do is you need to get a copy of the paper, you need to get yourself a green pen and you need to go through and correct your answers as I go through the questions. So question number one says when solid sodium chloride is mixed with water, sodium chloride solution forms. What name is given to the process of mixing a solid with water to form a solution? The answer is dissolving. The sodium chloride will dissolve to form a solution. Sodium reacts with hydrochloric acid to form sodium chloride and hydrogen. Write a word equation for this reaction. Well, sodium reacts with hydrochloric acid, so it's sodium plus hydrochloric acid goes to give sodium chloride plus hydrogen and you've got two marks one mark for the left hand side and one mark for the right hand side The next one, it says the hazard symbol shown in figure one is used on containers of sodium. That means that it is highly flammable. It can catch fire. So the answer is B, flammable. Part three says um, hydrogen has one electron in its electron shell. Figure two shows an incomplete dot cross diagram of a hydrogen molecule. Complete figure two to show the electrons in the covalent bond between the two atoms of hydrogen. Where each hydrogen has one electron, we draw one from one atom is a dot, the other from the other atom is a cross, and you end up with a dot and the cross between the two shared pair of electrons in the covalent bond and that is hydrogen. The pH of sodium chloride solution was measured. State what could be used to measure the pH of the solution. Well, you can either use an indicator, universal indicator and the pH scale, or you can use a pH meter. So probably the best answer is to say a pH meter. And it says sodium chloride solution is neutral. Give the pH of this solution. Well, the um, pH scale goes from one for a very concentrated acid all the way up to 14 for a very concentrated alkali. And neutral is in the middle. So it's going to be seven. Seven is on the pH scale is neutral. So you've got one mark for saying seven. Question two says chlorine has an atomic number of 17. Figure three shows the arrangement of electrons in an atom of chlorine. Well, there are 17 electrons around chlorine and they go two in the first shell, eight in the next shell. That gives us 10 and then seven in the next shell. So the electronic configuration of chlorine is two, eight, seven, which was C. And it says, explain using figure two why chlorine belongs in group seven of the periodic table. Well, all atoms in group seven have seven electrons in their outer shell. So it has seven electrons in its outer shell. It has seven electrons in the outer shell and remember it's the outer shell electrons which determines what group it's in group one have one electron in their outer shell group two two electrons in their outer shell chlorine is in group seven so it's got seven electrons in its outer shell the next part is all about subatomic particles protons neutrons electrons it says the nucleus in an atom is made up of protons and neutrons. Atom of, of chlorine have 17 protons. 
figure four shows information about a proton, a neutron, and an electron, and it tells you the mass and charge of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Explain, using the information in figure three and figure four, why atoms of chlorine have no overall charge. Well, figure three showed that it had 17 electrons. Electrons have a charge of minus one. That's what it tells me there. Now, it must have 17 protons. In fact, up there it says it's got 17 protons. And protons have a charge of plus one. So it's got 17 negatives, 17 positives for one mark. And they cancel each other out. The negatives and the positives cancel each other out. So it has 17 negative charges. I'll put electrons. And 17 positive charges from the protons uh, which cancel each other out to give no overall charge. The next one, atoms of chlorine 37 have a mass number of 13.7. Calculate the number of neutrons in uh, in atoms of chlorine 37. Well, if it's 37 protons and neutrons, minus 17 protons, that is going to give us 20 uh, neutrons equals 20 and that's the number of neutrons the number of neutrons is the mass number minus the atomic number so the number of protons and neutrons minus the number of protons there are two isotopes of chlorine chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 explain the meaning of the term isotope an isotope is the same element I'll put in brackets same number of protons but different mass because it has a different number of neutrons. So isotopes are atoms that are either heavier or lighter than each other and they have a different mass because they have a different number of neutrons. They're the same element because they have the same number of protons. So question number three. In the 19th century, Mendeleev arranged the elements known at the time to form his periodic table. Mendeleev's periodic table in, is different from the modern periodic table. State one difference between Mendeleev's periodic table and the modern periodic table. Well, it didn't have as many elements, it, it had gaps. The biggest difference was that Mendeleev arranged his table according to relative atomic mass and the modern periodic table is arranged according to atomic number. <clears throat> so Mendeleev arranged um, by increasing um, mass modern 
arranged by increasing atomic number. Aluminium oxide reacts with hydrochloric acid to form a salt plus water. State the name of the salt formed. Hydrochloric acid forms chloride. The metal is aluminium. So it's going to be aluminium chloride. And you had lots of practice naming salts in your course. State the type of reaction that takes place between an acid and a base. Well, that is a neutralization. Anything that reacts with an acid neutralizes the acid. They are neutralization reactions. Gallium is in the same group in the modern period table as aluminium. The formula, of, the formula of aluminium oxide is Al2O3. Predict the formula of gallium oxide. Well, it's going to be Ga2O3. I think that's quite obvious. But you've got to make sure that you get a capital G and A. That's gallium. And I get two galliums to every three oxygens. And the last question uh, what type of gallium oxide has a very high melting point? Gallium oxide does not conduct two electricity as a solid, but does conduct one molten. What type of substance is gallium oxide? Well, gallium is a metal. Oxygen is a non-metal. So it's going to be an ionic compound, an ionic compound formed between a metal and a non-metal. Part D says figure five shows the changes in state of gallium and the arrangement of particles in liquid gallium. Complete the boxes for solid gallium and gaseous gallium by drawing the arrangement of particles in each of the physical states. Well, in a solid, you need the particles arranged in nice, neat rows that are touching each other. I'm just going to draw three rows like so but they have to be in neat rows and they have to be touching. And then in gaseous, you just need a few particles that are well spaced out and not touching. That was an easy two marks. Give the name of the change in state labelled Y. Well, if it's going from gas to a liquid, it's condensing. Uh, you could have condensation, condensing. Um, gallium metal is a conductor of electricity. Explain how metals conduct electricity. Well, you need to know that metals contain delocalized electrons, and those delocalized electrons can move through the structure of the metal. So, metals. contain free, better word is delocalized, which can move through the metal and carry charge. Electrons have a negative charge and by carrying charge that is what the flow of electricity is. Electricity is the flow of charge. Question four, some metals are found in the earth's crust as uncombined elements. Reactive metals are found in ores. In ores, metals are combined with other elements. Which of these metals is found uncombined? There's only one metal that is found uncombined, uh, and that is gold. You pan for gold. You can find it naturally in the Earth's environment. All other metals you find is their oxides or other compounds. Give two advantages of recycling metals rather than extracting metals from their ores. Now, the big 
common answer that is incorrect here is that by recycling metals, <clears throat> you can reuse the metal. Well, that isn't an advantage of recycling the metal. By reusing the metal, what it means is that you don't have to mine new metal ores and you don't have to refine new metal ores. Well, extracting metals and refining metals uses a lot of energy. So um, mining causes um, loss of habitat. So the two best answers are um, no loss of habitats due to mining metal ores and the second one uses less energy than extracting new metal. Okay, and the last bit, an iron ore, an ore of iron is mostly iron oxide, Fe2O3. Iron can be extracted from this iron oxide by heating with carbon. Balance this equation for the reaction that takes place. Now, it's given you a 2 in front of the Fe2O3. That means two lots of Fe2O3. So I'm going to have four ions and six oxygens. So I need to put a 4 in front of the Fe. Um, if I've got six oxygens, I'm going to have to have three carbon dioxides. And that gives me three carbons. So three, four, three for one mark. Most copper ores are described as low grade. This means that the percentage of copper in the ore is very small. 5,000 kilograms of one copper ore was found to contain 42.5 kilograms of copper. Calculate the percentage of copper in the ore. Now that's quite easy. It's um, 42.5 um, divided by 5,000 times 100 to turn it into a percent. So it's um, 42.5 divided by 5,000 percent. And that gives you um, less than 1%, actually. It's 0.85%. So uh, 0.85 goes in there. Part E says, in one stage of the extraction of lead from its ore, lead oxide is heated strongly with carbon. The equation for this reaction is two lots of lead oxide plus carbon goes to give two lots of lead plus carbon dioxide. Now, explain using this equation which substance has been oxidized. So I need to state which it is, and then I need to explain. Well, the carbon turns into carbon dioxide by gaining oxygen. So the answer is carbon has been oxidized as it gains oxygen. Remember, the definition for oxidation is gaining oxygen. Lead oxide has been reduced because it loses oxygen. A titanium ore was analysed and found to contain 12 grams of titanium atoms combined with 8 grams of oxygen atoms. Calculate the empirical formula of this titanium compound. Titanium has a, has a mass of 48 and oxygen has a mass of 16. So the way that we've taught you to do these empirical formula calculations, 
you write down the two elements, titanium and oxygen. You write down the number of grams. Titanium has got 12 grams. Oxygen has got eight. You divide those by the RFM. So it's 12 divided by 48 and six, eight divided by 16. So it's grams divided by rams, RFM. Now you then write down the two numbers that you get from that division. So that is uh, 0.25 and 0.5. Now, if I multiply both sides by um, 2, I get uh, 0.5 to 1, um, which is the same as 2 to 1, isn't it? 1 to 2. So um, the formula of titanium oxide is therefore two lots of oxygen to one lot of titanium. So it's going to be Ti, you always put the metal first, Ti1, I don't put the one in, O2. So it's TiO2. Question number five says, figure six shows the apparatus that can be used to electrolyze sodium sulfate using inert electrodes. Hydrogen is produced at negative electrode. Describe the test to show the gas is hydrogen. Well, hydrogen burns with a squeaky pop. So you add a lighted spint and you get a squeaky pop. So add If hydrogen you get a squeaky pop. Now, if you put squeaky pop test, you didn't get any marks. You had to say the first mark, add a lighter splint to get the second mark. So if you just said it gave a squeaky pop, you didn't get a mark. You had to say that you add fire to it or you add a lighted splint to it and it makes a squeaky pop. You had to say the first mark before you got the second mark. The name of the gas X is actually going to be oxygen because it's like the electrolysis of water. You get hydrogen at one electrode and oxygen at the other electrode. State what is meant by the term electrolysis. Electrolysis is using electricity to split up a compound. So it's using electricity to split up a compound. So um, what you can do with electrolysis is you can take a compound of a metal and a non-metal and you can get a metal at one electrode and a non-metal at the other electrode. The next one says sodium sulfate solution was made by dissolving 28.4 grams of sodium sulfate in water to make 250 centimetres cubed. Calculate the concentration of the solution in grams per decimeter cubed. Now, this unit here is grams per decimeter cubed. The minus three means divided by decimeters cubed. So I work that out by taking the grams and dividing it by the decimeters cubed. So I take my mass in grams and I divide it by my volume in decimeters cubed. Now my volume is in centimeters cubed. So the first thing I need to do is transfer 250 centimeters cubed and I need to divide that by a thousand, which gives me 0.25 decimeters cubed. And then I need to divide my grams by my decimeters cubed. So it's 28.4 divided by 0.25. Now that gives a number of um, 113.6. And you got two marks if you put that down. The third mark was for giving that to three significant figures. One, two three so i round up my point six and it becomes one one four 114 
Um, the next part, the ions present in sodium sulfate are Na plus SO4 2 minus. Write the formula of sodium sulfate using this information. Well, the way that you were taught this is sodium Na plus 1. Sulfate is SO4 2 minus. So the formula of sodium sulfate, that's called the crossover rule, is Na2SO4-1. So it becomes Na2SO4. The other way of thinking about that, if, if, if sodium is plus 1 and sulfate is 2 minus, the compound sodium sulfate has to be neutral. So I need two plus 1s to cancel out the minus 2 from the sulfate. In figure six, the gases given off at the electrodes are collected in test tubes. However, the actual volume of gases cannot be measured using these test tubes. Suggest an apparatus that could be used in place of the test tube in figure six to measure the volume of the gas. Um, well, you could use an upturned measuring cylinder. So measuring cylinder was probably the easiest answer. You could use an upturned burette or something like that, but just a measure center. State what could be added to the circuit to show that current is flowing. Well, if there's current flowing around the circuit, then if you put a bulb in it, then the bulb would light up. You could also use a buzzer or an ammeter, but a bulb is probably the easiest answer. Right, we're starting to get to the uh, trickier questions at the end of this paper now. So it says um, the word equation for the reaction between copper carbonate and sulfuric acid is copper carbonate plus sulfuric acid gives copper sulfate plus carbon dioxide plus water. Complete the balanced equation for this reaction. Copper carbonate. So I need to put in the formulas of sulfuric acid and the formulas for copper sulfate. Some of you knew that copper sulfate was CuSO4. Sulfate is SO4, um, sulfur and oxygen. Um, sulfuric acid is hydrogen sulfate, and it's got the formula H2SO4. Um, calculate the relative formula mass of copper carbonate, CuCO3. Well, copper carbonate has got copper, one, carbon, one, and oxygen, three, CuCO3. Now, each of those has a mass. Um, copper is 63.5 times one. Um, carbon is 12 times one. And oxygen is 16 times three. If I do those multiplications and add them all up, I get a figure of 123.5, which is the final RFM. 123.5. Um, the multiple choice, what is the chemical test to show that the gas is carbon dioxide? And the answer to that is you bubble it through lime water and the lime water turns cloudy. You've been doing that test since year seven, so you should know that. Part B, figure seven, shows a conical flask containing the dilute sulfuric acid and copper carbonate is added to the flask. The copper carbonate is added one spatula at a time uh, until the reaction is finished. State two observations that would show that the reaction has finished. Well, when you add copper carbonate to dilute sulfuric acid, you get carbon dioxide gas produced. So it would bubble while it was reaction reacting. Now, when it has stopped reaction reacting because all the acid has been used up, then it would stop bubbling. So stop bubbling is the easiest answer. Um, now, it changes colour and it will stop changing colour. So stop changing colour was allowed, but it would also 
once you've used up all the acid, if you keep adding copper carbonate, there would be unreacted, unreacted copper carbonate. So you can't say um, the copper carbonate would stop reacting because that's not an observation. It needs to be an observation. But you would see unreacted copper carbonate, which would also be cloudy. Um, and the solution would go cloudy um, when all of the acid has been used up. The next one is the six mark question. And it says, describe how you would obtain a solution of copper sulfate from the mixture and how you would obtain pure dry copper sulfate crystals from this solution. Your description should include the apparatus you would use. You may wish to use diagrams in your answer. Well, you need to include the apparatus. If it says you may wish to use diagrams, then you should use diagrams. You've got copper sulfate solution and you with excess copper carbonate in it. So the first thing that you need to do, there are basically two steps. One, filter off the excess copper carbonate and you would do that by taking a filter funnel a filter paper you would put the solution through the filter paper in the funnel out the bottom you would get copper sulfate solution and on the filter paper you would get unreacted copper carbonate now you need to label these. This is filter paper. This is a funnel. And this is the beaker. Um, this is unreacted copper carbonate and coming out the bottom into this beaker this is copper sulfate solution so you literally you take once your reaction is finished you take the mixture of the unreacted copper carbonate and the copper sulfate that you've made and you pour it through a filter paper and funnel and you collect the copper sulfate out the bottom and you get the unreacted copper carbonate on the filter paper. Now, the second step is to crystallise is crystallization. So I'm going to take my copper sulfate solution and I'm going to crystallize it to get copper sulfate crystals. Now, the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to put it in an evaporating basin. I'm going to put the evaporating basin on a gauze. I'm going to put the gauze on a tripod. And I'm going to heat it gently with a Bunsen burner. There's my Bunsen burner. Um, so this is evaporating basin. This is my copper sulfate. This is a Bunsen. And 
this is a tripod. Now, crucially, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to evaporate it to dryness. So the steps that I'm going to use when I'm doing crystallization is one heat the solution gently. I don't want to heat it strongly and I don't want to evaporate off all the water to evaporate about half of the water. Three, allow the solution to cool and form crystals. Four, isolate the crystals. And five, dry the crystals in an oven. So that is the way that I get pure dry crystals of copper sulfate from copper sulfate solution.